This video is gonna be a little bit different from what I usually do. I'm having a little midlife crisis. I don't really know who I am anymore. So we're trying something new. And it, this is definitely gonna be something new. This is a very long video essay about the deadliest cult to ever exist, as far as I could tell from my research. So if that's not something you're into, if you don't like heavy topics, feel free to pass on this one. I won't be offended. But yeah, this is the story of Jonestown and uh, how it became. Jim Jones was born on May 13th, 1931, during the midst of the Great Depression. After being crippled in World War I, Jones' father struggled to keep a job. This, coupled with the economic constraints during the 30s, caused Jones's dad to lose his job. Jones' family was forced to move into what was essentially a shack. It had no electricity or plumbing, and food was scarce. It was so scarce that the family would take to foraging in a nearby field to keep from starving. There's a little town in Indiana. The moment I think of it, a great deal of pain comes. As a child, I was undoubtedly one of the poor in the community, never accepted, born as it were on the wrong side of the tracks. Jones would often wander around town barefoot, conversing with people, when one day during one of these adventures, the wife of a local pastor gave him a Bible. After reading through it, Jones became enthralled with the ideas of religion and death. Going so far as to be baptized in multiple churches and holding mock funerals for roadkill that he would find just laying around town. At times with other children and other times just completely alone. It was around this time that Jones became convinced he had developed special abilities. At one point, he was so sure of his ability to fly that in order to prove it to other kids in the neighborhood, he jumped off of a roof. Surprising absolutely no one, Jones didn't in fact have the ability to fly and plummeted to the ground, breaking his arm in the process. This, of course, didn't stop him from continuing to tell everyone that he definitely did have special abilities. Weirdly, Jones himself once told a story of how around this time he switched out the holy water in his church with his own urine, and that that has absolutely no relevance to anything. I just thought it was kind of funny and odd for someone to just openly admit to doing that. Needless to say, Jones was pretty messed up as a child. Well, I guess also messed up as an adult, but we'll get to that. It's suggested that Jones may have acted out as a child due to his inability to make friends. One time even saying, I was ready to kill by the end of the third grade. I mean, I was so aggressive and hostile, I was ready to kill. Nobody gave me love, any understanding. In those days, a parent was supposed to go with a child to school functions. There was some kind of school performance and everybody's parents was there but mine. I'm standing there alone, always alone. At the same time Jones was feeling this way, he began to develop an interest in politics and social movements, reading works from Hitler and Stalin to Karl Marx and Gandhi. But as World War II started, Jones developed an intense interest in the Nazi party, going as far as to get other children to goose step together and then beating those children that disobeyed him. In high school, Jones became less politically outspoken and focused far more on his faith, attending up to four services a week and wearing his Sunday church clothes to school every day. He often berated other students who he caught smoking or drinking. During these years, his views around racism and segregation began to form. After witnessing the treatment of African Americans during a baseball game he attended in Richmond, Indiana, Jones became deeply disturbed. Feeling of an outcast, I'd early developed a sensitivity for the problems of blacks. I brought the only black young man in the town home, and my dad said that he could not come in. I said, then I shan't, and I did not seen my dad for many years. But it wasn't until Jones was in university that he heard Eleanor Roosevelt give a speech on the plight of African Americans that he became more outspoken and advocated for things like communism and other radical political views of the time. It was also in university that Jones met his future wife, Marceline. But despite his what would now be seen as virtuous views on race, Jones was still as depraved as ever often subjugating his wife to loyalty tests where he'd inform her that a close friend or a relative had suddenly died, 
only to console her over the loss before finally telling her that the story wasn't true. Fast forward to 1952 when Jones decided to become a minister, partly due to his faith, but also believing that infiltrating the church would be an effective way to legitimize his Marxist views. This only lasted roughly two years though. Jones was eventually dismissed as a minister. And there's some conflicting accounts as to why. The church says it was because Jones was stealing church funds, while Jones later claimed that he in fact left the church after its leaders refused to let him integrate blacks into his congregation. This dismissal eventually led Jones to forming his own church, a church he would eventually call the People's Temple. By 1960, Jones had grown the church's popularity significantly. By espousing ideals of racial equity and communism, the average attendance at the church grew to roughly 1,000 people, most of these people being African American. His goal was to gain as much attention as possible with his sermons, going so far as to perform faith healings during congregations, believing the more people he could attract, the more funds the church could bring in. And he was proven right. Using the newly acquired church funds from the growth in membership, they began opening and operating different local amenities such as soup kitchens, care homes for the elderly, multiple foster homes, and a complex for the developmentally disabled. All of this work in the community eventually led to the mayor of Indiana appointing Jones as the director of the local Human Rights Commission, which just absolutely thrilled Jones. This gave him the legitimacy to secure radio and television spots where he'd go on the air and talk about his socialist ideas and the ones held by the church. Even once getting the opportunity to speak at a meeting of the NAACP and the Urban League where he garnered wild cheers by encouraging the audience to be more militant towards racial equity. He would even plan these sting operations at local restaurants, trying to find owners and staff that would refuse to serve black customers. By this point, Jones and his wife had also began building what they referred to as their rainbow family. It started with the adoption of their daughter who is part indigenous, then the adoption of three Korean American children, followed by their own biological son. And lastly, they became the first white couple in Indiana to adopt a black child. As Jones' popularity and standing in the community continued to increase, so did membership and money for the church. He began to use his newfound social power to influence the people around him more and more. Jones started saying that part of the ideology of the church should include members giving up all of their possessions. I represent divine principle total equality, a society where people own all things in common, where there is no rich or poor, where there are no races. Whether it be cars, clothes, homes, or even things like social welfare and social security, and people that still had employment outside of the church were instructed to give their entire salaries to the church. In return, the church would take complete care of them, housing them, buying them clothes, paying for their medicine and their doctor's visits, the dentist, and pretty much anything that was needed. This drastic growth of the temple's financial power in turn led to um, an inflation of Jones' ego. As the money came in, he felt more and more justified to enact his personal will on his followers. This sudden growth in loyalty and income also fed into Jones's self-delusion that he was a Christ-like figure who possessed special non-human abilities, whose sole mission was to keep the members of the church in complete commitment to its communist goals and to bring about um, heaven on earth. But even with his newly found source of income and devotees, Jones quickly began to realize their message would never really be received as widely as he would like if the church remained in the conservative Midwest. In 1961, Jones had a premonition of Chicago being the epicenter of a nuclear attack, destroying it completely and leaving Indiana to be engulfed with the fallout. This premonition led Jones to become increasingly more paranoid and fearful. As Jones began to look for a way to escape the destruction he thought was imminent, he came across a January 1962 Esquire article that named South America as the safest place on earth to live during a nuclear holocaust. So. Jones and his family decided to set out to Brazil in hopes of finding a new and permanent home for his church, making a quick stop in Guyana along the way. Remember Guyana for later, 
because it becomes pretty important. The family stayed in Brazil for two years, helping the locals build low-cost homes while still hoping to find a suitable and safe place to move the church to. During Joan's absence from the church, regular attendance plummeted, falling to under a hundred people. While in Brazil, Jones would demand that the church send all of its revenue to aid in his mission looking for a new home for the church. But after this failed to materialize and the church was on the brink of financial collapse, Jones reluctantly decided to return to Indiana in 1963 to preach to his remaining followers. In order to raise more money for his failing church, Jones decided to sell the building that had been the home of the People's Temple and start traveling around holding healing campaigns for local groups around Indiana. Now, either to distract his remaining followers from the financial hardships of the church or in a last ditch effort to test their loyalties, Jones told his congregation that the world would be engulfed by nuclear war on July 15th, 1967, leading to a new socialist Eden on earth. So Jones decided the church must move to California for its own safety. And by 1965, Jones and his followers had decided on a place, Redwood, California. This would be their new home, the place the church would move to, and all the followers began moving. Roughly 140 of Jones's most devoted followers made the move to California. During the next two years, Jones worked as a teacher in a nearby town where he'd preach to his students about the benefits of Marxism in an attempt to recruit students to the temple. He even went as far as to plant loyal members of the temple in his classes to help bolster his message. And by the end of 1968, Jones had increased membership of the church to 300 people. <laughs> Started with about 141 people. And from that, we've grown to a very thriving congregation. We have about every level of society, all socioeconomic income strata, professional down to the ordinary field worker, field labor. Uh, really, it's beautiful to see that all these divisions have been broken down, not only race, but any differences of economic position. Being free of the conservative mindset of the Midwest, Jones' rhetoric at his sermons became much more aggressive. He began leaning more on his socialist beliefs while vilifying what he called traditional Christianity. Jesus Christ uh, had the most uh, revolutionary teachings uh, to be said, in the sense that he said to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, uh, take in the stranger, minister to those the widows and afflicted in their suffering. And we feel that no one really tried Christianity too effectively or the Judeo-Christian tradition. He would refer to Christians' view of God as a sky god who was no god at all. You're going to help yourself and you'll get no help. There's only one hope of glory. That's within you. Nobody's going to come out of the sky. There's no heaven up there. We'll have to make heaven down here. He said, if you see me as your friend, I'll be your friend. As you see me as your father, I'll be your father for those of you that don't have a father. He said, if you see me as your savior, I'll be your savior. He said, even so, if you see me as your God, I'll be your God. With Jones' fiery rhetoric and sermons, the church message began to quickly spread across California, leading to churches being opened all up and down the Californian coast, most notably in Los Angeles and San Francisco, the latter becoming the headquarters of the People's Temple. And by 1973, just eight years after moving the People's Temple to California, Jones Sermons had a regular attendance of around 3,000 people. His over-the-top persona and politically charged sermons in the politically charged time of the 60s set Jones up to be the figurehead of a new movement. And with this newly found power, Jones quickly began using his influence to infiltrate California politics. Well, in 1975, there was a mayoral election in San Francisco, a conservative candidate and a liberal candidate, George Moscone. Jones had several hundred people who would go door to door election day. Instead of a group that might give you 20 or 30 of these people or 100, you had three or 400. God bless you for being here and let's go on and win. The Moscone election was very close. The margin of victory was probably no more than 4,000. So you had to credit a big chunk of decisive votes to People's Temple. He met with everyone from the first lady to the vice president and the governor of California to even celebrities like Jane Fonda. You've managed to make 
uh, the many persons associated with People's Temple part of a family. If you're in need of health care, you get health care. If you're in need of legal assistance of some sort, you get that. If you're in need of transportation, you get that. And that's the kind of religious thing that I'm excited about and have some respect for. Little side note, one of the craziest stories I found was at one of Jones's faith healing sermons, he brought up this little old lady who was in a wheelchair and told her, today is your day. You are going to walk again. And his whole congregation just went crazy. And as she gets to the front, he starts saying, take that step, take that step over and over again. So this lady slowly gets up out of her wheelchair and takes this small, shaky step. And Joan says, now take your other leg and do it. And sh sure enough, she takes her other leg and just takes another shaky step forward. And then Jones commands her to start moving towards him. And again, sure enough, she starts walking slowly up to him. Then after walking up to Jones, she suddenly starts running up and down the aisles of the temple while people completely lose their minds around her. Only later was it found that the lady was actually just one of Jones's secretaries and the entire healing had been fabricated. Now, I know this seems pretty obvious to all of you like it did me, but just imagine being back in the 70s at the height of faith healing's popularity and you see this guy who claims to be God command an old woman to rise up out of her wheelchair and she starts running around. I'm pretty sure I'd start losing my mind too, but who knows. With the church's growing public profile from these faith healings and crazy sermons also came scrutiny from the media and past members of the church. In 1972, Lester Kinsolving released an expose reporting on long-standing accusations of physical abuse and financial fraud carried out by the church. Jones quickly sent out members of the church to attempt to stop further publication of the expose, which was successful, but unfortunately for Jones, the allegations were now in the public consciousness, revealing the dark underbelly of what the temple and its members were truly partaking in. This expose was the first big blow to Jones's power. He was labeled as a false prophet who was using the facade of community and religion to abuse and take advantage of the people that followed him. A year after the expose was released, eight people decided to flee the temple. Jones sent search parties after them, but to no avail. The group fled all the way to Montana before officially documenting their complaints. After this, in hopes of evading any legal action taken against him or the church, Jones decided to begin looking for another place to move the people's temple to. He searched for a country that would closely match the ideals held by the church and somewhere that his socialist plan of community could fully come to fruition. And in 1974, he chose Guyana. Guyana was a South American country that had recently freed itself of British rule and was currently being governed by socialists. After traveling the country with political officials, Jones decided on a 3,800-acre piece of land located in the northwest region of Guyana. The Guyanese welcomed it because there was currently a dispute on the border of Venezuela and Guyana, and they hoped that if they put a bunch of American socialists right on the border, close to the border, it would dissuade any aggression from Venezuela. This was also beneficial to Jones because that area of Guyana was not very populated. It was very far from any towns where people could escape to and get any help from, and he figured that this could be a place where he could build his utopia and not have anyone be able to leave. While Jones was looking, pressure started to mount on the church back in California due to Jones's legal issues for soliciting sex from a male police officer in a public bathroom. Weirdly enough, though the temple had the arrest sealed, the many public accounts of abuse and cult-like behavior and the spreading of rumors of Jones's sexual exploits began to weaken the church's standing in the public eye. According to members of the church, this led to Jones turning his sexual advances towards existing members of the congregation, using his now amplified gospel to justify his actions and dissuade members from speaking about their abuse. This behavior continued until 1977 when a second expose was written. 
This expose threatened to shed light on the growing number of misdeeds happening inside the People's Temple, from financial fraud to forcing members of the church to sign over all their material assets. The article was a turning point for Jones. He became more and more paranoid of the people around him and began forcing members to commit heinous acts against one another. They would do such things as spankings, uh, being urinated on, being vomited on, or even going as far as to make them box one another until one of them was knocked unconscious. It wasn't a week that went by that I wasn't called up on the floor because of my behavior, because of my attitude. Stanley Clayton, up front center. You might fight five people in one night. Well, you know, <laughs> you're very tired. <laughs> I've seen situations where they actually knocked the person out and actually took water and threw the water back on, woke him up and, wo and woke him some more. Before the article came out, Jones was contacted by the editor to give him a heads up on the details of what was going to be released, saying she did so out of respect for Jones as a public figure and because of the letters of support the publication had received from people like Governor Brown, who was the current governor of California. As the editor read the article to Jones over the phone, Jones wrote down a note on a piece of paper for the temple leadership that was around him. The note said, we leave tonight, notified Georgetown. The very next day, Jones was in Guyana. See, they've made progress on the road and leveled it. Clear in the five miles that you're seeing in the distance, housing complexes that are being built. Despite the lack of supplies and infrastructure, or any plans for the future, by 1978, Jones had convinced close to 1,000 people to join him in what he now dubbed as Jonestown. Like I said before, Jonestown was isolated in the jungles of Guyana. This was seen by members as a necessity to keep the utopia away from the rest of the world, but regardless of whether that was true or not, the result was it made it nearly impossible for anyone to leave. For Jones, it was a place where his authoritarian tendencies finally had a place to flourish. Inhuman punishments and mind games became a part of everyday life for members in Jonestown. Back in the US, a mother won a court battle to have the church return her five-year-old son to her. The US court ultimately awarded custody to the mother, but Jones refused to let the son leave Jonestown. This led to multiple families who had relatives in Jonestown to begin calling for the US government to intervene in the matter. And they called themselves the Concerned Relatives. With the backing of the Concerned Relatives, the father of the five-year-old, who was a defector from the church, traveled back to Guyana in hopes of retrieving his son, but left the country fearing for his life. Jones had garnered power within the Guyanese government and had formed what he called the Red Brigade. The Red Brigade not only operated as the police force of Jonestown, but also as Jones's personal army. Jones would routinely test the loyalty of his followers, having them participate in something that he called white knight drills. Every night at some point, his voice would come over the loudspeaker and he'd say, I'm sending somebody out tonight, somebody you know, somebody you trust, and they're going to act like they want to leave. But this is a loyalty test, and you need to turn them in. A father would turn in a son, a husband would turn in a wife, a small child would turn in a parent. There was no freedom to express to one another what was going on because everything was suspect. The most forbidden thing to express was to leave. Jones continued to manipulate his followers by controlling their connections to the outside world, making it forbidden for outside media to make it into Jonestown, while over loudspeakers that would cover the entirety of Jonestown, Jones' voice could be heard repeating the same messages over and over again of how the U.S. was an evil capitalist empire determined to kill or re-enslave the entire black community. I make my stand clear. Give us our liberty or give us our death. At least on those terms, we choose our death and no one chooses it for us. This obviously led to a growing paranoia within the members of Jonestown. Many members would write to their families 
asking for help and to know what was going on. But unbeknownst to them, Jones was monitoring all incoming and outgoing mail and would censor anything that would paint Jonestown in a negative light in any way. Despite the growing concerns that something was amiss in Jonestown, the government was still hesitant to intervene. But all of that would change in May of 1978 when a Temple member named Deborah Layton escaped from Jonestown, warning that Jones was prepping his followers for a mass After Layton and the concerned relatives began filing lawsuits against the People's Temple, accusing them of human rights violations, they caught the attention of Congressman Leo Ryan of California. Ryan, who had previously met with the father who had failed to get his son out of Jonestown, began an investigation into what was happening there, but was very quickly shut down by the State Department. Quick side note about who Congressman Ryan was. Back in the day, he was a very activist kind of politician. He went so far as to spend, I think, a week in prison because he wanted to see what the conditions were like and to know whether or not they needed to be updated for prisoners at the time. This kind of hands-on approach and activist mentality is what led Ryan to do what he would do next. He announced that he would travel down to Jonestown in December with a small congressional delegation. The plan was for Ryan to visit the compound to see firsthand what life was like in Jonestown and whether or not any control needed to be taken away from Jones. While preparing his followers for the delegation's arrival, Jones gave them two options. One was to escape to Russia, and the other was the choice Jones truly wanted. The one that he had prepared them for through years of manipulation, death by their own hands. On November 17th, 1978, the congressman arrived in Jonestown with 19 other people. Among them were two members of his congressional staff, reporters from the Washington Post and NBC and other smaller San Francisco outlets, and a man named Richard Dwyer. Remember that name because it will be very important later. Ryan's delegation was meant to arrive the day before on the 16th, but Jones had refused to let them in, leading the congressman to believe that something sinister might be underway. Jones had attempted to block the visit entirely, perceiving the incoming delegation as an attack from outside enemies. But Ryan told Jones that he would be entering Jonestown on the 17th, whether Jones liked it or not. Expecting to see a community in complete disarray, the congressman is surprised when he is happily welcomed at the gates. He finds a well-organized Jonestown full of happy people ready to sing the praises of Jim Jones. I've never been so totally happy or fulfilled in my life. I can't begin to describe it. You could sit here and talk all day long and no words could describe the peace, the beauty, the sense of accomplishment and responsibility and, and camaraderie that's here. It's a... Uh, it's overwhelming, it really is. You can't describe it. That night, Jones asks Ryan to give a speech on his experiences at Jonestown. I think that all of you know that I'm here to find out more about uh, questions that have been raised about your operation here. But I can tell you right now that from the few conversations I've had with some of the folks here already this evening, that. Uh, Whatever the comments are, there are some people here who believe that this is the best thing that ever happened to them in their whole life. Later that night, a man attempts to pass a note to one of the NBC reporters, as low-key as he can. When Congressman Ryan came, I wanted to pass him a note. I said, help us get out of Jonestown. When one of the reporters was walking around towards the edge of the pavilion, I stuck the note in the fold of his arm, and it fell to the ground. And so I picked up the note, and I, and I gave it back to him. I said, you dropped something in this little boy about nine years old starts saying, he passed a note, he passed a note. A similar note is passed to another person in the delegation. The congressman is informed of the notes and the focus of the group turns from that of relief to that of concern and fear. Originally, Ryan and the reporters asked upwards of 70 people what their experience in Jonestown was like. 
and if they wanted to leave, and none of them indicated so. Are you happy here? Oh, I should say I am. I've never been any happier in my life. You want to stay? Definitely. I certainly do. Some people have said they couldn't leave if they wanted to. Do you think you could? Yeah, if, if I really wanted to, I'll, I'm free to go. If I was really, if I really wanted to, I'd be able to free to go. Well, I believe it. I've been here a few days, and I have, I have absolutely no complaints at all. It is really nice here. It is really nice. And I'll be leaving in a couple of weeks, and they could come with me. But they said they didn't want to come. Hello, family. It's been a, it's, it's such a joy and great pleasure being here because of Father's love we are trying to make, and we are making a place of refuge for all of you here. Uh, there's no, no, nothing at all that I would, that I have any holdings there. I do not want to go back in any way, shape, or form to, uh, to the States. I love it here, and this is the place where all of you are going to be. But now that others had voiced their opinion to leave, more and more people began approaching the delegation asking for help. As night fell, the members of the media that were in the delegation were forced to return to the nearby airstrip as they weren't allowed to stay in Jonestown. Upon returning to the airstrip, the group is approached by three local Guyanese police officials. The officials confirm the accounts of abuse and say that they have been unable to intervene due to Jones's lease with the country, which had given him complete and total autonomy over Jonestown. This revelation drastically heightens the concern of the media and the entire group. The following day, the media returns to Jonestown and begins questioning members and Jones himself more intensely. And by 3.30 that afternoon, 15 Temple members confirmed to the congressman that they would like to leave Jonestown with the delegation. Now do I both understand you say that you both want to leave Jonestown on this date, November 18, 1978? Yeah. Last night, someone came and passed me this note. He's the one that I'm just talking about. Yeah, let's see, try me. This, this is the man that wants to leave his son here. Doesn't it concern you, though, that, that this man, for whatever reason, one of the people in your group... People was... play games, friend. They lie, they lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going, leave us. I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. Anybody wants to get out of here can get out of here. We have no problem about getting out of here. They come and go all the time. I don't know what kind of game. People like, like who, who, people like publicity. Some people do. I don't. But some people like publicity. But if it's so damn bad, why is he leaving his son here? Can you give me a good reason for that? The 15 defectors and most of the delegation board a bus that will take them back to the airstrip while Ryan and two others from the delegation, including Richard Dwyer, agree to stay behind and leave the next day in case any other followers decide they'd also like to leave. But before the bus can leave, a high-level member of the People's Temple attacks Congressman Ryan with a knife. Congressman Ryan is directly across from me, and I saw this Temple member walk up behind him, and he was actually crying and shaking. And all of a sudden, he pulled out this knife and said, all right, motherfucker, you're going to die. We all jumped on him, and there were just screams of horror everywhere. After the attempted attack, at the direction of Richard Dwyer, the congressman agrees to accompany the bus to the airstrip. He wants to stay behind and save as many people as he can, but the situation is quickly becoming volatile. Still, Ryan tells Jones that he won't let this experience change his views of Jonestown. Okay, a little note before we continue on in the story. One of the 15 defectors that chose to leave Jonestown was a person that was very, very close to Jim Jones. And a lot of the people that were choosing to defect kind of argued and didn't want this person to be able to, to join the group with them because they thought that he would have nefarious intent. But Ryan mostly just wanted to get as many people out as he could. So he agreed to let this person join the delegation and leave with the rest of the defectors. So the bus carrying the media, congressional delegation, and the 15 defectors arrives at the airport shortly after 4.45 p.m. Having to be scrambled under short notice, the plane arrives nearly 30 minutes later, but it will be too late. Back at the encampment, Jones is in a frenzy. 
He doesn't believe the congressman and thinks that his words, along with the defectors, will lead to the end of Jonestown and the People's Temple. Thinking he has no other choice, Jones begins to enact the plan he spent nearly two years preparing for. During this, the chaos begins at the airfield. The defector that I had mentioned before that had everyone uneasy was, of course, a plant from Jones. He was sent with a very specific mission to get on the plane with Congressman Ryan and execute the pilot mid-flight crashing the plane. But in the chaos, he was boarded onto the plane with the other defectors and not Ryan. This plant in the defectors, whose name is Layton, begins to grow more anxious that he won't be able to carry out his orders, but Jones has already enacted his backup plan. Once he heard that the Guyanese government was sending a second plane to extract the additional defectors, he ordered the Red Brigade to the airfield. So while Ryan and his delegation are attempting to board the defectors onto the planes, a tractor carrying Red Brigade members pulls up to the airfield. They drove this truck all the way across the run, the uh, airstrip and stopped on this side of the plane. So literally, they cut us off from the jungle. We never know there's people hidden inside the dump truck. The moment they stop, they stop shooting right away. As they begin to circle the larger plane, the smaller one is beginning to taxi to the runway to take off. And this is when Layton, the plant in the group, pulls out his pistol and begins to open fire on other defectors around him in the plane. He shoots two people, but then is obtained by other passengers on the plane, fortunately. While this is all happening, at the other end of the runway, the Red Brigade is still firing on the other group. And this group includes Congressman Ryan. All you can hear is a gun pop, 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 goes off constantly. We lie flat on the target at that moment. But shortly afterwards, I heard my partner, the cameraman, he yelled, shit, he said he got, he got shot. He was sitting up. I felt a tremendous explosion right next to my head. I got a tremendous pain ran through my arm and on my shoulder. I was really shaking, but I didn't move. I took the pain and hold still. The brigade is obviously sent to do a specific mission and they find their targets as soon as they can. Within a matter of minutes, the shooting stops completely and the Red Brigade hops back in their tractor and departs from the airstrip, leaving five people dead. Bob Brown, a cameraman, and reporter Don Harris, who both worked for NBC News, Greg Robinson, a photographer for the San Francisco Examiner, a defector by the name of Patricia Parks, and Congressman Ryan himself, who was shot an estimated two dozen times, including in the head at close range. The remaining survivors take cover in the nearby jungle in fear of another attack. Back in Jonestown, Jones has gathered all of his followers into the pavilion of Jonestown to give his final sermon, purposefully waiting to reveal the chaos that he himself had just ordered on the airstrip. He eventually tells the congregation that someone is going to shoot the pilot and crash Ryan's plane, but this was not his plan. Because what's going to happen here in a matter of a few minutes is that one of those people on that plane is gonna, gonna shoot the pilot. I know that. I didn't plan it, but I know it's gonna happen. They're gonna shoot that pilot and down comes that plane into the jungle. And we had better not have any of our children left when it's over because they'll parachute in here on us. As Jones is starting to get to the climax of his sermon, he starts to get more and more specific. We can't go back. They won't leave us alone. They're now going back to tell more lies, which means more congressmen. And there's no way, no way we can survive. He then asks if anyone in the group has a dissenting opinion. And one woman speaks up, asking why not take one of the other options previously laid out, escape to Russia. Is it too late for Russia? Here's why it's too late for Russia. They killed. They started to kill. That's why it makes it too late for Russia. Otherwise, I'd said, Russia, you bet your life. I think that there were too few who left for 1,200 people to give them their lives for those people that left. As long as his life is hope. I will take your, your call. We will put it to the Russians. And I can tell you the answer now because I'm a prophet. Call the Russians and tell them to see if they'll take us. I said I'm afraid to die. I don't By think no you means. are. I don't think you are. But, uh... 
I look at our babies and I think they deserve I, to live. I agree. You know? They des but also they deserve what more? They deserve peace. I haven't seen anybody yet that didn't die. And I like to choose my own kind of death for a change. I'm tired of being tormented to hell. That's what I'm tired of. Tired of it. 1,200 people's lives in my hands, and I certainly don't want your life in my hand. But I'm going to tell you, Christine, without me, life has no meaning. The other members of Jonestown then start booing the woman and are audibly upset with her questioning the decision of Jones. Christine, you're only standing here because he was here in the first place. So I don't know what you're talking about, having an individual life. Your life has been extended to the day that you're standing there because of him. No man didn't take our life right now. He hadn't taken it. But when they start parachuting out of the air, they'll, they'll shoot some of our innocent babies. I'm not, I don't want to see this, Christine, because they got to shoot me to get through to some of these people. I'm not letting them take your jar. Can you let them take your jar? <laughs> What's that? You mean you want to see John, the little one that keeps I him? want to see... This is one of the most chilling parts of the entire Jonestown story to me. Even when this woman, who is part of the group, tries to speak out on how she doesn't think children deserve to die to, due, due to the actions of other people, the other members have been so convinced, so manipulated by every word Joan says, that they angrily shout this woman down, who's only trying to save lives of children. After this back and forth, Jones gets the news that the congressman has been killed, and begins the final part of his sermon. Talking, the congressman has been murdered. It's all over, all over. What a legacy, what a legacy. Completely sure there is no coming back from this, Jones gives the order to start handing out the poison they had prepared earlier that day. You got to move, are you gonna get the medication here? You got to move. There's nothing to worry about. Everybody keep calm and try and keep your children calm. I'm crying from pain. It's just a little bitter tasting, but they're, they're not crying out of any pain. It's hard. It's hard. Only at first. Only at first is it hard. It's hard only at first. Living, you're looking at death. It's only looks to, living is much, much more difficult. At this time, half of the crowd is cheering and the other half is screaming for this to stop. I would respect die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. There's nothing to death. It's like Max said. It's just stepping over in another plane. Don't, don't be this way. Stop this hysterics. This is not the way for people who are socialist or communists to die. No way for us to die. We must die with some dignity. This is a young kid. His name is Thurman. When he came inside, he bumped into me. At that same time, he's falling to the ground and he's going into convulsion. I grabbed the kid from his shoulders up. In that process of taking him out of the pavilion, this kid died in my arms. I mean, I, I mean, I just, I just felt the life go out of him. To me, I, at that point, I knew that this shit was real. They were coming, taking like newborn babies out of the mother's arms. As I walked up to the back of the pavilion, I saw a woman named Rosie on the ground, crying, holding her dead baby. There were maybe eight or nine other people who were dying or in the process of dying. Inside, I just wanted things to stop. Please, just let me catch my breath. Let me figure out what's happening here. I looked to my right, then I saw my wife with our son in her arms and poison being injected into his mouth. My son was dead and he was frothing at the mouth. You know, cyanide makes people froth at the mouth. My wife died in my arms and my dead baby son was in her arms and I held her and said, I love you, I love you, because that's all I could say. It was like, She died in my arms, man. My wife came up to me 
She, she didn't have no tears in her eyes. She just was, was just in a daze. My mother, my grandmother, my sister, my brother, how are they gone? You know, she said, just take me, just take me and just lay me down next to my grandmama. And she went up to that Kool-Aid, to that death barrel. And she just didn't hesitate, just took it and, and drunk it and then told me to hold her, to take her, and I did. And she died in my arms. And, um, and once I laid her down and she told me how she wanted to lay with her, grand, her, her grandmother, I, um, at that point, knew that I didn't have no reason to be here anymore. Jones is dead set on completing what he sees as his last revolutionary act, and he won't let anyone get in the way of it, but starts to waver on his own participation. I want to go, I want to see you go, though. I, they can take me and do with me whatever they want to do. I want to see you go. I don't want to see you go through this hell no more. This is where I start to think that Jones was actually planning on making it out of this situation alive, which in my eyes makes him even more of a monster. The fact that he did all of this, manipulated all these people into giving up all of their possessions and move across the world with him just so he could play God and inevitably convince them to give up their lives when he demanded it. And the fact that he had all of this planned out for years and was testing different types of poison, getting licenses so he could acquire different amounts of cyanide needed to make poison for 900 people. And then last minute, he seems to be indicating that he is just going to watch them all die while he gets taken into custody. There is literally no words to describe how evil Jim Jones is. So as the poison works its way through the crowd, the cheers and screams become more and more distant. Some members, still are thanking him and calling him dad, showing how much they support him until their, their dying moments. I'd just like to thank dad because he was the only one that stood up for me when I needed him. And thank you, dad. And I'd just like to thank dad for giving us life and also death. And I appreciate the fact the way our children are going. Because like dad said, when they come in, what they're going to do to our children, they're going to massacre our children. And also the ones that they take captured, they're going to just let them grow up and be dummies like they want them to be. And not grow up to be associates like the one and only Jim Jones. The next day, the Guyanese authorities would discover Jones's body laying on the ground with a gunshot wound to his head. The story of Jonestown immediately gripped the world. Images of hundreds upon hundreds of bodies neatly laid out in rows circled around the globe. The official cause of death was ingestion of potassium cyanide and potassium chloride. Out of all of this chaos, 36 people in Jonestown had managed to make it out that day. A mother who, upon realizing what was happening, took her children and ran past the guards into the jungle and walked all the way to the closest village. A 76-year-old woman hid under her bed after hearing the announcement and stayed there until 7 a.m. the next day. Another elderly man who was hard of hearing missed the announcement completely for everyone to come to the pavilion and after realizing what had taken place, laid down in a ditch and pretended to be dead. In the end, 918 people died that day, with 304 of them being children. Okay, so now we are going to dive into the conspiracy theories surrounding Jonestown. And many of these theories kind of formed out of the doubt of the official narrative. By no means am I endorsing or trying to get you to endorse any of the theories that I'm going to discuss. 
I just believe that going through the reaction and, and the, the fallout is, is just as imperative to avoiding another Jonestown as the story itself is. A lot of these theories, like most conspiracy theories, were formed due to the either conflicting information around the tragedy or some of the more controversial aspects of what happened. Again, not endorsing any of these theories. I just find them interesting. I think it's interesting to learn about how people react to situations like this. Okay, so the first one. The CIA had a vested interest in not only letting the massacre happen, but in aiding in it coming to fruition. Its operatives were the ones who killed Jim Jones and Congressman Ryan and the majority of people in the People's Temple for its own political purposes. Okay, so going all the way back to 1953, Chetty Jagan, a Marxist revolutionary running for the People's Progressive Party in Guyana, won the first ever Guyanese popular vote election. This result caught the CIA's attention, who at the time was just filled with fear of communism spreading across the Western Hemisphere. Being smack dab in the middle of the McCarthy era, fear and persecution of communism, and the people who supported it was at an all-time high. There is many documented cases throughout the 50s and the 60s of the CIA directly interfering in countries where they thought communism could take hold. In fact, in these documented cases are ones involving the CIA funding oppositional unions to strike against the Jagan-led government. So after gaining official independence from its former British rule in 1966, Britain and the CIA tried to maintain control of Guyana by backing Jagan's opposition who was opposed to Jagan's more radical views. If you know anything about the CIA's past in nation building, this probably doesn't come as a shock. But to those who don't know, this tactic of stoking political unrest while backing opposing parties in hopes to install governments that have more favorable views towards US foreign policy, you could just ask Iran or Brazil or Chile or Lebanon or Cuba or yeah, you know, you get it. It's a lot. Seeing as they had so much experience in the matter, the CIA successfully helped oust Jagan in 1968, installing what they thought would be a more US-friendly leader. This victory was short-lived though, as the new leader ended up forming close ties with communist countries such as Cuba and the Soviet Union. This is partly why Jim Jones chose Guyana as the final place to move the People's Temple, seeing as the government were aligned closely with his own political and social views. So all that leads some to think that after more than two decades of work, the CIA wasn't going to take very kindly to over a thousand US citizens deciding to pick up and move to Guyana, hoping to take part in a communist utopia. It's not really hard to see why theories have formed around the CIA's involvement. If we assume the CIA just continued its work in Guyana, it seems only natural that an, an eclectic character like Jim Jones and his group of outspoken socialists, mostly consisting of minorities, could have quickly become a top priority for the CIA. The government first took notice of Jones in the early 60s when the temple moved to California after their massive increase in membership but no investigations ever really led anywhere, except leading to heightened paranoia in Jones, which would only grow after he moved to Guyana. There's speculation that some of the white knight drills were actually attempts to flush out a suspected CIA mole, though obviously no one was ever caught during these. Weirdly though, a decade before the massacre took place, a book written by a German journalist named Julius Mader, who's who in the CIA, named one of the people who were part of the congressional delegation to Jonestown, Richard Dwyer, as a high-level CIA agent. You know, that guy I told you to remember because it'd be important later? Okay, we're back to it now. This is pretty weird and hard to ignore as the book was proven factual on many different occasions, even having people named in the book publicly confirmed by the CIA itself as agents. In the tape of Jones' final sermon, you can hear him specifically mentioning Dwyer's name twice. Take Dwyer on down to the, the East House. Get Dwyer out of here before something happens to him. Dwyer? I'm not talking about you, Jara. I said Dwyer. 
Most official reports of that day place Dwyer at the airstrip with the congressman. So I don't know why Jim Jones would be mentioning him if he was already at the airstrip. Speaking of Congressman Ryan, Ryan was very outspoken about the CIA and FBI's covert operations in foreign countries, and he was often apprehensive towards them almost entirely, even going as far as to advocate for a congressional oversight of the agencies. In 1974, he co-sponsored the Hughes-Ryan Amendment, which would have the president report any and all covert operations of the CIA to multiple different congressional committees for oversight. The reason Ryan ended up in Guyana in the first place is due to the State Department routinely blocking his attempted inquiries into what was happening in Jonestown. The CIA was not a fan of Jones' socialist ideology and critiques of capitalism, or leading people to follow him out of the U.S. to an established socialist country, a country where the CIA had recently lost some of its influence. So the CIA organized a group of special forces to go into Jonestown to kill Jones and his followers and frame it to look like they had done it themselves. At least that's what the theory says. But this kind of leads me to question why Jones and the Red Brigade wouldn't have attempted to fight off an impending attack from the CIA, which which means they probably would have tried some sort of covert attack to minimize any evidence of their presence. Well, remember that guy I mentioned, Richard Dwyer, the suspected high-level CIA agent that was a part of the congressional delegation? This is where he would hypothetically come into play. Again, despite reports placing Dwyer at the plane with the congressman, Jones is heard in his final recording, which is happening at the same time as the attack on the airstrip, telling his followers to get Dwyer out of the compound. And I have racked my brain over and over trying to figure out why Dwyer would have stayed behind, and I literally cannot come up with a single thing. I, I can't think of a single reason. Like maybe he was just there to influence the outcome that occurred, maybe? This theory goes even deeper though. Apparently, and this is according to the theories, not me, this entire operation was carried out as a means to get rid of Congressman Ryan. Remember the dude who was openly against the CIA? The guy who was introducing bills to give Congress direct oversight over the CIA? Yeah, okay. So this theory claims that the CIA saw a golden opportunity by linking Ryan's death to the followers of Jonestown, the CIA could simultaneously get rid of one of its most ardent opponents in government, while also getting rid of a group of radical socialists that could potentially undermine the US capitalist system. There's also the fact that after the attempted stabbing of Ryan, he was pretty adamant on staying in Jonestown another night, to which Dwyer, the maybe CIA agent, thought that he should go to the airstrip for his own safety. The airstrip, where witnesses say the hit squad that pulled up in the truck clearly had their targets picked out prior to arriving, and once they had killed them with insane precision, and in Ryan's case a little overkill, hopped back in their truck and immediately left. Ryan's family even went as far as to file a lawsuit alleging that the CIA was involved in Ryan's death, but after looking into it as, as much as I possibly could, all I know is that they ended up dropping the case for no specified reason. Hello, this is future editing me, and I, I realized I found a little more context on this, um, which is that there, there was a person who was aiding the family uh, with their lawsuit against the CIA with uh, w about Ryan's death. And um, maybe one of the reasons that they stopped is this this person that was helping the family uh, started receiving letters at, at their home, uh, which they assumed were from the CIA that would say things like, uh, we're watching you, which is pretty unsettling and probably aided or, or, or contributed to the reasons why the family kind of let the lawsuit go. Um, even though the, the reasons that it, it was dismissed have never been fully disclosed. So yeah, that, that might be that might be a good reason because getting letters from the CIA would not be the most fun thing. Um, I'm assuming I've never gotten one, so who knows. Finally, the last piece of this theory puzzle, the extra 
chocolate drizzle on the on the CIA Sunday is a man by the name of Mark Lane. Mark worked as a lawyer for the People's Temple and was somewhat of a conspiracy guy himself. He vehemently defended the suspected Martin Luther King assassin, James Earl Ray, saying that he was just a patsy and it was really the government who had orchestrated the assassination of King, which, you know, definitely isn't the craziest conspiracy out there. If you're interested or, or need more convincing, watch Wendigoon's video on the MLK assassination if, if you know, you need a little more more there there. Mark Lane was also gearing up to start an investigation into the Kennedy assassination when he went to Jonestown as a part of the congressional delegation. But after the incident at the airstrip where Ryan was killed, the CIA used Mark's ties to the People's Temple as a way to discredit him entirely, saying that the judgment of a man with such close ties to a cult that resulted in the deaths of 900 people shouldn't be trusted especially when those theories are as crazy as the government having something to do with the deaths of JFK and MLK. Sounds like a crackpot theory if I've ever heard one. I don't really know the CIA that well, thankfully, but I feel like they're, they're more of like a hands-off when it comes to larger groups like that. They like to manipulate from the outside and, and not really get in and do the dirty deeds. So I don't know how I feel about this this theory, but I just wanted to bring it up because I thought it was pretty interesting that there was so many kind of moving parts behind the scenes and so many different things that were happening in, in the past and the lead up and, and where the CIA was involved. In, and I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention because it kind of it makes you question a little bit what might have actually happened. I was going to dive into the, the theory of how Jones and the Temple were a part of the MK Ultra experiments, but I don't know. After digging into it, it just is so messy and convoluted that it, it pretty much disproves itself within itself. So I won't waste your time listening to it like I wasted my time researching it. The most plausible conspiracy theory I did find while researching this is the claim that the majority of people in Jonestown didn't take the poison willingly. And there's also accounts from survivors that back this theory up. Some saying that they only decided to escape into the jungle once they saw their fellow temple members being dragged out by the Red Brigade. Hello, future me. Again, uh, I found more context on, on this theory as well. Um, so the Guyanese government sent in their top pathologist, Dr. Mutu, and uh, he spent 32 hours in the ridiculous Guyanese heat um, examining the bodies of the people of Jonestown. And after going through 187 bodies that were, were killed by injections, um, he kind of said that he, he gave up or, or the team gave up themselves. And he noted that the victims had been injected in, in portions of their bodies that they could not have reached themselves, such as like the, the upper back of the arm or between their shoulder blades in their back, and also said that those injections were done by people who knew what they were doing. Oh, there was there was also um, this, this U.S. Army Special Forces uh, person uh, named Charles Huff, who was one of the f the first seven Green Berets that showed up at Guyana, that said that the troops found uh, many bullet wounds as well as crossbow bolt wounds. He also said that uh, many of the people who were found with these wounds seem to have been running towards the jungle in, in hopes to escape, um, and they they had clearly not made it. Um, but the people who had committed these acts, which I'm assuming was the Red Brigade, um, had escaped Jonestown and were not there by the time Huff and his team had gotten there. Um, kind of indicating that uh, people were not only injected or, or willingly took the poison, that there was some who were trying to flee. So that kind of adds to the idea that this wasn't so much a mass suicide by a bunch of people who agreed. Um, there was a good amount of people who were trying to escape. Um, and this was probably m a, a mass murder. The idea of this being a group who chose to unalive themselves versus one who didn't choose that is much easier for the majority of people to handle. And also conveniently sets up a nice narrative for the CIA that socialist leaders are not to be trusted, aka 
don't drink the Kool-Aid, you know, that weird saying that was for some reason normalized, even though it's in reference to one of the largest tragedies in American history outside of natural disasters and military incidents. The official narrative of the followers choosing their fate also lets the government off the hook for holding any responsibility in this tragedy, because not only would people have been outraged that the American government had let this many citizens be murdered on foreign soil, but also the concerned relatives group had been warning that Jones wanted to do this for years and was planning something exactly like this. Regardless, the followers of the People's Temple were beaten, tortured, and brainwashed to the point where I'm not even sure you can say any of them willingly chose to do this. They were manipulated by a man who promised them heaven on earth, who, who fought for racial equality and justice for all people, only to not realize he was slowly planting the seeds that would lead them to their deaths. By the time the followers got to Jonestown, Jones seemingly completely dropped his facade, monitoring all communications in and out of the compound, not letting any word of the outside world in while, while constantly blaring his voice all over the camp saying that blacks were being rounded up and put in concentration camps back in the U.S., running white night drills and, and constantly testing the loyalty of people around him. I believe he did all of this to purposefully break the minds of his followers, to put them in a state where he could do whatever he wanted to them and they wouldn't question it at all. Jones used fear and hope to gain as much power as he possibly could. And as soon as he saw that power starting to slip away, as soon as he saw the first cracks in Jonestown starting to show, he utilized his power, well, what was left of it, to bring to fruition the plan that he had been putting in place for years. A plan that was fueled by a childhood fear of being left alone. You can call what happened in Jonestown a mass shot if you want to, but in my opinion, Every single man, woman, and child in that place was murdered by one of the worst cult leaders in modern history. Well, that one was very heavy. That was a very heavy topic to research and to talk about. But if you made it this far, I just want to say thank you so much. So very, very much. Um, this was fun for me to do. I don't know. I, I have a weird sense of sense of fun. But... Um, I really enjoyed learning about this. I like learning about history. I like learning about what leads people to, to do some of the things that they do. And, and you know, the, the story and the history of Jim Jones and the people and how they got into the position that they were in is, is something that really interests me. So um, if you got this far, I hope it interested you too. I, I hope that you, you learned something new. Or, um, you know, if you'd never heard about this before, I hope that you you learned something completely new. I'll probably be doing another one of these kind of similar to this, uh, but it, it takes me a little while, so it won't be up for, for a bit, but I'm, I'm working on it. I got some good ideas. Uh, if you have any ideas of things you'd like me to, 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 to cover in this manner, feel free to leave it in the comments and, and I'll, uh, I'll take all those ideas. I'll, I'll, I'll put them all together and I'll try and do that. So uh, thank you again friends. I'll, I'll see you when I see you. Bye.